Uh, quick announcement. Uh, two weeks' time, uh, we're having our annual general meeting, or I think maybe we call it our quarterly business meeting. I'm not sure which it is. It's, one, it's a meeting that's important, and you need to be here. Uh, so that's following the service in two weeks' time. That's Sunday, November 26th annual general meeting. Please make note of that in your calendars so that you can join us for that. We're going to be discussing some important church business and anticipating uh, some really exciting things that, that God is doing here as we move forward and get ready for 2018. Wow. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm praying this morning for, uh, for grace here and for for protection. Um, the, the, the message this morning is, is a tough one. And uh, I better just say this, that there's going to be some content that may, might not be suitable for, for younger people. Um, it won't be explicit, but it's important that we cover some of the things and that I say some of the things that I will be saying. So uh, I just want to give you that, that heads up. Uh, I want to start here in Ephesians 6, and uh, Paul says this, Ephesians 6 verse 10, he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In verse 13, he says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand. Here's the thing, uh, I say this, I, I realize I say this often, we are in a spiritual battle, and it is very real, just because a spiritual battle isn't, isn't seen necessarily doesn't mean it, it's not very real, and, and it certainly is, and, and it is intense. We are in a battle, a battle between darkness and light. And it's a battle for people's souls. In fact, for the souls of this next generation. Here's the thing. Satan, the devil, hates God. Hates him. And he hates anything that God loves. He hates us. He hates people made in God's image. And Satan wants nothing more than to see us dead. In every sense of that word, spiritually, physically, separated from God. That's what he wants. And so this battle is against Satan and his forces, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, as we just read. Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. Jesus says this in John 8, 44. He calls him a murderer from the beginning. Not holding to the truth, there is no truth in him, says Jesus. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. And his favorite thing to lie about, his favorite thing to spread his lies about is God and God's word. And the truth of God's word. He wants to keep people from hearing it and believing it because he knows that it's the truth that sets us free. And the flip side of the truth is, is lies. And if he can keep people believing lies, keep them from the truth, keeps them separated from God. We see Satan's tactic right from the get-go in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, we see this. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, 
you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Did, did, did he really, really say that? He gets us to, to question, to, to doubt God's word. And of course, this leads to the fall of mankind. Did God really say that's wrong? See, Adam and Eve were deceived. <laughs> I'm going to read three verses this morning. Taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. As we continue this series that I've called Knowing Where We Stand. I'm going to read this from the New King James Version. Because I think this is a, a very accurate translation of the original here. And I'm, I'm going to read this to you. Do you not know, writes Paul, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. This is an important passage in the Bible. They all are, but, but this one has great significance. Why? Because of the stakes. The stakes are high here. In these verses, Paul lists a series of sins which can disqualify a person from the kingdom of God. And did you notice his warning? Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. All of the sins listed in these verses are are rampant today. But there is one that stands out from the rest. And... It's unlike any of the others listed here, but not because it's worse, or not because Paul gives it special emphasis, because he does not. It's distinct because it's the only sin listed here that is now openly embraced and celebrated in our society. Homosexuality. None of these other sins is promoted so aggressively by entire groups of people, including an increasingly significant percentage of our population. Though adultery is still rampant, it's it's still considered wrong. Greed, wrong. Theft, still punished by law. Drunkenness, it's it's a terrible vice. Reviling. Others still frown upon that. Swindling or extortion, as some translations put it, will still get you thrown in jail. With the exception of fornication, these sins are still seen in a negative light. They're wrong. Homosexuality is the exception to the rule. And those now speaking loudest in support of it hold positions of power and authority in our government and society. What, what God's law condemns, Canadian law commends and is now even commanding its acceptance. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that. Perhaps you saw this headline this week. An evangelical Christian couple is accusing Alberta of discrimination, claiming their application to adopt a child was rejected over their religious views on gay marriage and homosexuality. The Edmonton married couple say they submitted their application last year and passed a required course for potential adoptive parents. But during a follow-up by officials this year, the couple say they ran into trouble when they answered questions about sexuality. The couple say they accept that same-sex marriage is a legal reality, but they don't support it and believe that homosexuality is wrong. The casework supervisor explained that our religious beliefs regarding sexuality were incompatible 
with the adoption process, says an affidavit filed in support of an application for a judicial review of the government's decision. The casework supervisor said this stance was the official position of the Alberta government. The province of Alberta requires citizens to profess agreement with and support for its state-sanctioned beliefs in sexuality and gender. And of course, there's the Trinity Western University case. Perhaps you've heard of this one, and this is an important one. In a legal battle that's been going on since 2014, Trinity Western University was denied accreditation of its law school because the school requires students to sign a community cover covenant which includes a commitment to reserve sexual intimacy to the marriage of one man and one woman. And they sign that. It's a Christian school. This battle for accreditation has been played out across Canada with the Federation of Law Societies of Canada affirming the accreditation while three of its members, including the Court of Appeal for Ontario, dissented, saying they would not accredit the school. Sunday, November 26th, in two weeks' time, will be a day set apart to pray for the successful resolution of the Trinity Western University case, which will be heard in the Supreme Court of Canada on November 30th and December 1st. The stakes are high. Our religious freedom is at stake. And, and so even more, more, more than ever, ever before in history, it is important that as followers of Jesus Christ, we know where we stand and we stand up for what we know, the, the clear teaching of God's word. Because, you see, it's not just the government and the media that's bought into this agenda. The church has to. In fact, many, many churches. And I'm not just talking about liberal, left-wing, theologically liberal churches. I'm talking about evangelical churches. Including churches in our own denomination. How did this happen? How did, how did we get here? You remember what Satan did in the garden with Eve? Same tactic. Does God really, really say that? Is it, is it really wrong? I mean, can it be a good thing in the context of, of a loving, committed relationship? Maybe we got it wrong. Maybe we need to re-examine and, and reinterpret what we, what we think we know, God's Word says. And so now, there are many voices within evangelicalism attempting to marginalize and, and relativize those passages of Scripture that deal specifically with homosexuality. And there are six of them, six primary passages there's the uh, creation account in Genesis 1 and 2, the Sodom account in Genesis 19, the holiness code in Leviticus 18 and 20, Paul's letter to the Romans, a few verses there in Romans 1, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that we'll be looking at today, Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, and of course, 1 Timothy 1, 10, Paul's letter to Timothy. These emerging voices within evangelicalism are arguing that the Bible does not have a comprehensive perspective on homosexuality. The only references to it are in the context, or sorry, are not in the context of loving relationships, they argue. Those six passages addressing homosexuality are only prohibiting violent and abusive homosexual behavior. And this is now the most widely accepted argument held today amongst evangelicals who support this. The Bible never directly addresses and certainly does not condemn loving, committed, same-sex relationships, they will argue. Matthew Vines, who is one of the leading proponents for the gay Christian movement today, he said this. He's written a book, by the way, called God and the Gay Christian. 
And here's what he says. The Bible is simply not referring to committed homosexual relationships. The only place in Scripture where male same-sex relations are actually prohibited in Leviticus comes in the context of an Old Testament law code that is never applied to Christians. The Bible never directly addresses, and it certainly does not condemn loving, committed same-sex relationships. How, how does he get that? Well, I, I just want to take a look at this argument for a moment because there's some major problems with it. When it comes to 1 Corinthians 6, the argument goes, and back there it is again, so you can look at it. The argument goes like this. Paul only understood homosexuality in terms of the violent and abusive examples in the Old Testament, with specific reference to Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. But here's the thing. This misses an important and striking parallel with Deuteronomy 6.1. What's, what's really amazing is in Deuteronomy 5, Moses gives the Ten Commandments, goes through them, each one of them, ten of them. And then he gets to, to chapter 6, 1, and we read this. Now this is the commandment, summing it up, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you so that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to inherit. The word inherit is the same word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 11. And he uses the same sort of structure. Moses has his list of 10. Paul has a representative list of, of 10 sins. Not a comprehensive list. That's not the purpose of it. But he's trying to suggest something I think that's very important we realize. That God's people, people of the kingdom of God, Old Testament and New have a code to live by. There is a standard, a holy standard for us. Now, as I mentioned, Matthew Vines argues that in these verses, Paul was drawing specifically from the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is not a story about homosexuality per se, but actually homosexual rape. So quick review, just for those who might not be familiar with it. This is fast here. In Genesis 19, God sent two angels to warn Abraham's nephew Lot about the coming destruction of Sodom. Lot welcomes these two into his home. He prepares them a meal, and then a group of men come and surround his house, demanding that he send out the two angel men so that they might have sex with them. And Lot, of course, refuses to do that. As the story goes, they end up getting ready to break into the house to take these men forcibly. And that's when the angels step in. They pull Lot inside and blind the crowd. So, this argument suggests that when the Apostle Paul refers to homosexuality and sodomy here, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, he was actually denouncing rape and pederasty. Pederasty is the sexual abuse of boys by men, which was a known practice by some Roman and Greek citizens. So, in 1 Corinthians 6, the argument goes like this. Paul is not explicitly condemning loving homosexual relationships, but violent and abusive homosexual relations. And this is the argument that's gaining the most widespread acceptance within the evangelical community. And it's thus used to justify from a biblical stance the legitimacy of committed monogamous homosexual relationships. Here's the problem. When we actually consider the language that Paul uses in these verses, it's clear that that is not what he's talking about. And let me show you what I mean. The Apostle Paul was a man of profound specifics. He was so specific, in fact, that he was known to create words in order to make sure his readers understood what he was talking about. And it appears that that's what he's done here. The first word translated in the New King James Version as homosexuals is the Greek word malakos. Quick Greek, Greek lesson here. It means the passive partner in the homosexual act. 
The second word translated sodomite here is, is the Greek word arsenikoites, and it means the active partner. So Paul very deliberately has both sides in view here. And what's especially striking is that Paul has actually created this word by using two words taken from Leviticus 18.22, which is the holiness code as we just referred to, the holiness code in Leviticus. And he takes these two words from this verse, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman, that is detestable as the NIV puts it. He takes the word arsenos, which means man, and koiton, which means to lie with, and then he makes this new word that linguists say shows up here for the first time in the Greek language, arsenokoites. Why is this important? What does this mean? It means that Paul's understanding of homosexuality here is not rooted in the violent narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah, but in the holiness code found in the book of Leviticus. Let me just explain that for a quick second. Leviticus 17 to 27, those chapters are called the holiness code because it's all about holy living on the part of God's people. That's the focus. And it covers every area, economic, social, sexual, family, And Leviticus 19.2 provides the foundation for this call to holiness. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And of course, as we saw last week, this is reiterated and repeated throughout the New Testament. Be holy because I am holy. The holiness code in Leviticus has two basic parts to it. There's the moral law and the ceremonial law. Ceremonial law was for a given people at a given time. And ceremonial laws change. But God's moral law is unchanging. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when God prohibits his people from having sex with animals or family members or people of the same gender, which he does in Leviticus 18 and 19, it's part of his moral code. And if you're ever confused about which is which, which of these laws are moral and ceremonial, you take a look at at which laws are come up again in the New Testament, are repeated there, you'll find that the New Testament upholds God's moral law. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so the New Testament continues to teach against these sexual sins, including adultery, fornication, and homosexuality, as we clearly see in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. Here's the thing. Let let me draw this back to here and now for us. What does this mean? The Apostle Paul is not saying that if you ever do any of these things, you're destined for hell. In fact, he makes it clear that people in the Corinthian church have done these things, and they're saved despite having done these things. And such were some of you, he writes. It's not those who sin who are excluded from the kingdom of God. It's those who refuse to repent of their sin. And that is the very real danger with the redefinition and misinterpretation of what God's word has plainly called sin. In seminary, we were taught to to clearly teach what God's word clearly teaches. And God's word is really clear about it. It takes a lot of imagination and, to be honest, some really questionable theological gymnastics to get to the point where you can argue against the plain teaching of God's Word, especially on this point. So how how are we to respond? What do we do? First of all, I'd say this. As faithful followers of Jesus Christ, we need to know and stand upon the truth of God's Word. Know what the Bible says. And what the Bible means. Pay very careful attention to what the actual verse is saying, along with the greater context that it's in, and the whole book, and the whole thrust. Otherwise, we can easily fall victim to someone using a a distorted interpretation of the Bible. Number two, this is an important point. Uh, Let's make sure that we denounce all sin and not just homosexuality. That's important. Let me be clear about something. This passage is not exclusively about homosexuality. It's not. 
In fact, it's just one of many. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, I think, is a good representation of the way Scripture presents homosexuality. It's there, it's clear, but it's not a major point of emphasis. It's really not. There's far more discussion about uh, adultery, about general sexual immorality, pornea, as Paul puts it. Of course, it's a part of that, but it's not the emphasis. The quickest way to forfeit our credibility and influence is to treat certain sins with partiality and others with scorn and condemnation. A gay person is no more distant from God than a liar or a porn addict or a thief. And again, let's remember, as Paul makes clear, such were some of you. And he's not saying that some were sinners and some weren't. Romans 3.23, all, all have sinned. Every single one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if left in our sin, no glory of God. We are... We are doomed to perish by repenting of our sin and turning to faith in Jesus Christ. We have been saved from our sin, sin that would have killed us apart from his saving grace. And even if your particular sin isn't found on this list we read here in 1 Corinthians 6, it's still represented, isn't it? It's sin that separates us from God, not homosexuality. Sin, all sin separates us from God. Maybe your struggle is not with homosexuality per se, but, but how are you doing with the run-of-the-mill heterosexual immorality? That covers everything from pornography to adultery. And, and it has no place in the life of a believer, of a kingdom dweller, one destined to live with God forever in his kingdom. What about idolatry? What about that one, guys? The word idolaters refers to a person who is tempted to love someone or something, anything more than they love God. Yeah. How are we doing with that? Now, this doesn't mean we won't struggle because we will. But when we've repented of our sins and turned in faith to Jesus, when we do stumble, we know that we can turn back to him who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to dust us off, to set us back up, and to keep going. See, 1 Corinthians 6 is not targeting homosexuality. It's targeting sin. And it's saying that those who persist in any sinful behavior give evidence that they have not repented of their sins. And until they do, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. My, my last point is this. How do we respond then? This is so real and so personal for so many of us. We respond as Jesus did. We love As Christians, we must believe with deep sincerity based on the clear truth of God's word that the embrace of homosexual practice along with all other sin keeps people out of God's kingdom. And so if our society celebrates it, we cannot celebrate with them. Because Jesus suffered and died to set us free from sin, all sin, even the sin that they don't call sin. It's sin. So we can't Love and keep quiet. We have to speak the truth in love. As we talked about last week, there's just too much at stake. People's souls hang in the balance. Do we get that? The spiritual battle is real. Christians must be against any and all sin, sin that enslaves and leads to death. The thing is, homosexuality is just getting a lot of the press because at this moment in our cultural history, It's the main sin that's just embraced and and, and endorsed in our context. Some people would like to see this whole issue of homosexuality divided into two groups. There's those who who celebrate it and those who hate it, and there's there's no in-between. You could put it this way, those who laud it and those who loathe it. But if the church does either of those things, it ceases to function biblically. 
God's intention for the church has always been that we would be a particular people, so particular in fact that that we would appear to be called out from the rest of society and culture. That's what the Greek word ecclesia means, those called out, set apart, different. So what does that mean for our reaction? Our reaction to, to homosexuality or any other sin must be the reaction and the response of Jesus Christ. Love. Responding like Jesus always means calling sin, sin, while loving the sinner caught in it. In John 8, verses 10 and 11, when the woman is caught in adultery, after Jesus shames those trying to point the finger at her and and have her stoned. And after they leave, they have this interaction. Jesus says to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Wow, what what a brilliant, loving response to someone caught in sexual sin. Jesus calls it what it is, but then invites her to live an entirely different new life, to turn from it in faith to God. See, what we have in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 is actually a passage of supreme hope. Look at how Paul ends this, this passage in verse 11. And such were some of you, but... You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We have something to say that no one else can say. You're wrong and you're loved. I read that this week on on John Piper's website. You're wrong and you're loved. No one else can say that. No one else can show that. We must love as Christ has commanded us to love. Neither do I condemn you, therefore go and sin no more. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word today. As, as difficult, God, as it is sometimes to, to read and to understand what we're reading, God, and, and to, to try to make those connections and and those applications to our life, a life that is to be obedient, Father God. We thank you for some clarity today, Father. And it doesn't make it easier. In fact, it makes it harder. (laughs) But Lord God, we, we know that we're not called to an easy path, but to a hard one, Lord. Help us to obey. Help us to trust and to obey. Help us to love others as you so loved us. Father God, help us to speak the truth in love because love rejoices with the truth. It doesn't delight in evil. So Father God, help us to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, to call others to the life that you've called us to where we're forgiven and set free where we've turned our backs on sin in faith to you, the God who so loved this world. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.